Good evening. I'm Dean Nito Taylor, Executive Director of API Legal Outreach. Welcome to our Rebuilding the Dream campaign. You know, for the last eight months, our staff has been working every day to address the critical needs of our communities, advocating for the rights of seniors and those with disabilities, representing survivors of violence against women, gender-based violence and human trafficking, preventing homelessness by assisting tenants and homeowners at risk of losing their homes, advocating for the rights of our immigrant communities in an unjust immigration system, and supporting our youth through services that work toward leadership development and violence prevention. This is our 45th year and normally we would be looking forward to getting together at a gala and reconnecting with old friends, meeting new supporters, but obviously we cannot do that this year. Instead, we are launching tonight a campaign, uh, Rebuilding the Dream, which will last through the end of 2020. The three month campaign will feature uh, three conversations televised. Tonight is the first one uh, that really focus on the core values of API legal outreach, racial justice, the prevention of violence against women, gender-based violence, including human trafficking, and the preservation and celebration of, of our communities of color, focusing on small businesses, our communities are essential to our history and our future. Communities such as Chinatown, Little Saigon, Soma Filipinas, the Mission and Japantown are essential uh, to our uh, communities in the Bay Area. Your support has sustained us over these 45 years and we hope that you will continue to support uh, because your support is vital to our services. As 2020 comes to an end, we hope that you are safe, that your families are healthy, uh, and that we stay that way, and that you can join us in rebuilding the dream. Tonight, the discussion uh, will be called When Shelter in Place is No Shelter. And we are privileged to be joined by three great panelists, contributors, uh, Becky Masaki, who, you know, doesn't really need an introduction, uh, but Becky is the co-founder and former director of the Asian Women's Shelter, uh, co-founder and former co-director of the API Institute on Gender-Based Violence, Emily Chum, director of social services for self-help for the elderly, and Jean Pham, who is the Social Service Youth Project Manager at API Legal Outreach. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and taking your time to uh, be, uh, be involved with our conversation tonight. You know, Becky, uh, the United Nations all the way to local counties have studied and reported that family violence, violence against women, uh, violence against older adults, uh, teen violence have all increased uh, because of the shelter at home kind of situation that we've been forced into over the last eight months. Maybe you could start us off by some thoughts around uh, this kind of impossible pressing issue that, that, that we face. Yes, Th thank you for inviting me and really having this um, important and so timely conversation. Um, for domestic violence and uh, human trafficking, survivors of that have expressed they're trapped in the place that they're living, whether it's their home or um, among others in, in a, the living space, um, they were trapped by violence and um, their lifeline or a way would be the way that we would help them to escape the violent home and create and be at Asian women's shelter or other safe place kinds of shelters or homes 
our safe spaces. Now, during this shelter in place COVID time, they are, it, it can be a very healthy and wonderful place if your family is safe and this is a safe place for you to be. Um, however, if you already had those dynamics of violence and the abuse of power, even more so, you're isolated and trapped, ironically, in your own home. I was thinking also a typical um, and common situation, especially in our API communities, is extended family, right? And so we all live in the same building or the same home, whether it's also for economics or also just by choice, this is a comfortable and typical way to live. Now extended family can be a lifeline to interrupt violence um, if one uh, of the family is being violent to the others, such as in domestic violence or child abuse or teen abuse towards the family, um, elder abuse, that can be interrupted in a healthy family. And that is what I'm um, asking and reminding everybody. However, if uh, there is uh, maybe a, per a particular person that's causing harm and everybody in that family either ignores it or also contributes, to that scapegoating or targeting of somebody for harm, then it actually ironically extended family becomes even more the dangerous kinds of shelter in play and magnified by shelter in place. Um, so I feel like the, this is an alert and a wake up call for all of us that this is a time where we need to be paying attention to our own uh, spectrum of the way that we are in our houses, because even the most healthy of us, sometimes it does get a little irritating or crowded for everybody to be all in a small space together. Um, so even in the small ways, it's time to like open up, be patient, find ways that we have our own space even if we are in the same house, just some alone time and together like that. Um, but also um, being mindful. And I feel like that I, I can talk about later too, but um, I want to move to the other folks. But that is another thing, you know, I was um, thinking that all of us can pay more attention to our neighbors. We're all in shelter in place. Mm -hmm. And I even heard a recent story where a neighbor kept checking in on um, a survivor, somebody who was experiencing violence in her home, who was the next door neighbor. And that neighbor said, oh, here's some food, put it on their porch or come and get some. I just made some, you know, baked goods come over. And that person was very isolated and would not come over, would not come over. But find the neighbor just kept saying, come over, come over. And then the woman did come over and that's where she disclosed what was happening and felt like she was in a safe place. And that was a way that she was able to, to escape from violence, even here in shelter in place. So that's just one, um, one story and something for all of us to think about how we are in community um, and in our own families. Mm. You know, um, ex before um, we go any farther, I just wanted to remind the audience that this is live. And so you have to kind of like go with it, or excuse any, you know, we're not on script or anything. But the other uh, aspect is that uh, we're, we'd like to address any questions that you have. So you need to sign into the chat if you'd like to ask any of our participants uh, questions uh, or, or, or have comments. Thank you. Emily, do you want to um, give us some thoughts and some uh, reflections on 
older uh, adults that uh, are in uh, difficult situations because of, of uh, the shelter in place? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, currently, during COVID, um, a lot of seniors have been reported uh, they're facing a lot of mental health um, uh, conditions where the anxiety, depression uh, has increased. Uh, a lot of um, that has um, been done by the social isolation because of the COVID. Um, because of this um, increase of social isolation, um, they are more dependent on their family members, uh, depending on their uh, caregivers. Um, so a lot of the, uh, uh, this will be some factors that contribute to the increase of elder abuse because um, like social programs, like senior centers and other um, regular programs that they, adult day health that they used to be able to attend. And now they are all uh, only limited in services where that serve as a gateway for identified elder abuse. So um, as they become more rely on others, uh, their self-esteem has de uh, decreased as well. So um, that's, a way for um, the elder abuse to happen when uh, the caregiver might uh, have financial abuse, scams, um, they lack of someone to check into uh, like they used to. So um, that it, we have a lot of uh, neglect and emotional abuse and financial scams. Actually, it's from someone that they know. Um, or someone that's uh, taking care of them. So um, we want to be able to let the senior know that uh, seek help and accept help and knowing that to identify a trust person, um, family members, friends, or the local community members that in case anything happened, they can report to us. And um, at many times, they um, seniors a little bit reluctant to report to others and they trying to not to disclose um, too much issues to others but um, we want them to we want to continue to promote that awareness among the seniors and the general public to identify their emotions even through the phone because recently uh, many uh, community programs are providing virtual services as well. Staying socially connected, it's a good way to uh, identify elder abuse, as we can see right now. Go ahead, Jean. Um, <laughs> thanks, Dean. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting uh, me to participate. I feel like, I, you know, I'm, I'm in this conversation table with giants um, in the community who are doing a lot of really great work. Um, I think, you know, the reason I was asked here is to speak in the perspective of youth, especially as youth um, who, um, you know, may be facing more precarious, um, precarious situations during the shelter in place. Um, I think Becky and Emily both raised with both really amazing points that, you know, relate to how youth are experiencing maybe heightened violence um, during, um, you know, digital term place orders as well. Um, you know, Becky mentioned that many, you know, API families are multi-generational. And I think with that comes, you know, with a lack of privacy. Um, when I think of, you know, the, the, the type of youth who are, you know, connected to our services, the ones who are seeking support, there's like a few, like um, you know, a handful of truths that we've kind of picked up down the line. You know, one of them is that you know, domestic violence, violence in the home, may not always be violence that's inflicted upon the um, the person itself. It can be violence that they're witnessing in the home. Um, if spouses are arguing in a very like violent manner, the child or youth witnesses that and they internalize it, and you know, this type of you know trauma, you know, is enacted and part of their development process as a, as a young person, as a youth. So I think one thing that we have to consider as practitioners and you know, as people in our community is, um, you know, broadening our perception of what domestic violence is really and how it can affect people um, who may be bystanders or, you know, um, dependents. 
Um, another aspect is, like I think Emily had mentioned, people who are um, abusers in a situation tend to be someone that you know. And this is information that we you know constantly share within you know our circles that usually um, there's like, I think this um, mythology that an abuser is someone random. You know, it's, it's someone that you don't know when the reality is um, you probably have a relationship with them. And when we talk about, you know, domestic violence, ultimately um, we define it as um, a relationship of power, you know, seeking control. And so under shelter in place, you know, th there is this sense of um, almost the double jeopardy where there is a lack of control where you can go, right? Because young people may, you know, in other situations, when we weren't in shelter in place, may have, you know, um, saw extracurriculars. They may have gone to their friends. They may have gone to internship or work as a refuge, as a second home to escape um, these forms of violence. That may, may no longer exist as an option. Um, so that form of control, you know, is taken away from them. And so I think like, especially now, you know, one of the, the major questions we, we've been dealing with this year um, within Appeal, within our youth project is, how can we better support young people? How can we support their mental health? How can we pr uh, provide alternative gateways for them to seek and access help? Um, and I feel this is, you know, like, I, I don't pretend that, you know, COVID hasn't been hard on us as, as uh, people who, um, deliver social services. And so this is um, kind of a process where we're, you know, asking questions and trying to find like answers together uh, within all these different community groups. But I think, um, you know, as Becky you know, showed and illuminated through her story, um, the process of community building is always, I think, the best solution um, in terms of like um, helping people get help and also um, you know, fighting away from that um, feeling of isolation of like being alone. Um, and that's my intro, I don't want to speak too much. Um, sorry. Thank you. So um, you all have talked about different aspects of, of family violence or interpersonal violence. I mean, is do you see any crossover between you know, domestic violence, elder abuse, and and uh, the, the teen violence. Um, it, oh, absolutely. I mean, um, thank you for inviting the three of us. Um, and, you know, it is all interconnected, right? It's intergenerational violence. And uh, whether it's within a family or the way we are in communities, and um, it it's, makes it even more important now for us to have that interconnectedness. Um, one example of that is, um, for example, you, um, you know, when I was thinking about what Emily was talking about, it reminded me of um, when I was, went before uh, COVID and shelter in place, I remember doing outreach, you know, education or training at the elder center or an event or a group that they were having and um, at the API elder with self-help for the elderly or other or places. And I remember one time I was giving um, a community awareness kind of talk. And one of the elders in, in that group said, that's me. And she says, I wanna come with you. And right then and there, she was made a bold move, but she actually literally wanted to come in my car together with me and drive to the secret location and be part of a safe shelter at Asian Women's Shelter. Um, that just gives an example of, you know, when we're there in person with each other, um, how folks could make that connection. And um, not just for, I mean, certainly for the physical way to get out of a dangerous situation, 
but also that mental and spiritual way you see each other as a whole self and can build that trust in and have a way out. So then I think, um, and what I've heard is now people are even more isolated. And even though we're all trying to do our best of having a Zoom support group, that's still an option or a way. Um, and yet we still need to find um, even more different ways. And that is why you folks who's listening to this, everybody really needs to step up and think, how can our community or how could I in my business or in the health center or other places really be um, another gateway, especially when folks are, are so isolated? So, so I know like senior has been um, affected the most um, because ageism, they thought uh, this virus affected um, older adults more. And then, um, so the fear and uncertainty, they balance between socialization while they go out, they, they worry about their safety. Um, but uh, when they stay at home, they, uh, um, they're feeling isolation. So uh, that's why we uh, start to promote uh, uh, virtual services and technology engagement for seniors um, to join. Um, like, for example, we have um, created WeChat group and then uh, promotes the use of Zoom. We have Zoom classes for seniors in different languages. Um, and then uh, we sometimes provide even devices and link them to discounted uh, senior um, the internet discount um, ways for uh, seniors to be more uh, engaged in technology. It's a way to um, be physically uh, isolated, but socially they are still connected with the community. So um, in terms of resources, virus, um, uh, the, the updates, um, you know, like the information for COVID is changing every day. And then, um, so if they can get the trusted uh, sources and information instead, instead, instead of uh, the overwhelming news a lot, and then so that can uh, reduce their stress. And also they can uh, seek community resources when they need to, to stay connected. So uh, we have been promoting the technology, but uh, we are grateful that many seniors to start using smartphone text, taking pictures, uh, video conferencing. So yeah, never say never. Mm -hmm. Right, um, when I think about how these different issue groups are related to each other in terms of you know, youth issues, um, elder issues and domestic violence, I think um, a lot of the solutions I, f I feel are very connected in terms of, um, you know, what is, like, what does it take for a survivor? What does it take for a youth? What does it take for um, um, an elderly person, an elder to, um, you know, be at a place where they can seek help or at a place where the, um, all their needs are met, right? It's in um, and for me, it's addressing their basic needs in terms of having a safe home. Um, and like, you know, Becky and Emily has, sh has shared, I think mental health is just this huge, um, encompassing, you know, cloud, you know, during um, COVID that, you know, I'm really glad that, you know, practitioners are thinking, are, you know, that's in the forefront of their minds. They're thinking about how can we address mental health as a root issue? Um, how can we make people feel empowered to seek services? How can we make people, you know, feel like there is hope? And um, sometimes that can be like the hardest thing, especially when, when we check the news and it's really, you know, really, um, in a sense, depressing all the time. It's so I really feel like another part of our work, um, you know, at Apilo, at AWS and um, through Self Help is, you know, providing a sense of hope for the people in the communities that we serve. Um, within the work that, you know, I do at Apilo, I think one thing that I have always noticed is you know, the, re the resilience of youth and also how savvy youth are and how um, just in the know and how much they want to help. Um, I think the main focus of our um, internship at Apilo for high schoolers is um, engaging with domestic violence and be, um, preventing it. 
And, you know, what's, that's one of the, I think the greatest things that come out of appeal that we have this multifaceted way of tackling violence in our communities, both by um, providing direct um, essential services, um, social and legal services, but also um, on a preventative aspect, trying to um, use education as a gateway to um, teach young people about how the cycle of violence occurs and how to like stop it and how to recognize it. I'll just take a second to remind people that we're taking um, questions um, for our uh, participants. So please sign into the chat if you have any questions you'd like to direct to any of them. Uh, this is one of the advantages of being live is, is that we can respond to uh, your interest uh, immediately. Do you guys um, have any thoughts about, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a given that we're gonna be sheltering in place for much longer than we first anticipated. Do you have any thoughts of, of what we should be kind of thinking about advising folks uh, who need assistance, whether they're teens or seniors or uh, uh, women suffering from violence uh, or, or gender-based uh, survivors. Um, any advice you can give them? I, I know it's difficult because they're, you know, the access to services is, is much more limited. I feel that um, advice would be just that you don't deserve that kind of violence, even if you feel like it's minimal, or of course, if it's huge. And, and we talked about mental health. So if you're feeling like, you know, you um, maybe not having as much physical abuse, but you feel fearful, or you just feel like, oh, you're um, being doubted, or uh, undermined those kinds of things that you can't just be your solid full self. Those are all important reasons to reach out and get help, especially we're so isolated right now. And so um, people have been creative about different ways that they can, you know, like a socially distanced walk, you know, being mindful about your mask, um, staying six feet away from each other, but at least, you know, walking with your friend outside um, around the block or those kinds of things. Um, the story I told about that neighbor who said, oh, you can pick up food on my porch. You know, those kinds of things. I think it's a nice time to be creative and think about it. Also, even in our virtual meetings, like right here, um, ways you can do a private chat to somebody or some way that you can let folks know or communicate. Um, I think all of that is important. The other thing, Dean, you said at the beginning that I really also wanted to, um, that it, it made me think about is um, all folks. So I'm thinking about, um, in the human trafficking area and like um, thinking of a story that I just heard recently about um, a transgender um, person that they were being abused in their personal um, relationship and then um, did was had so many barriers about where to seek help and then ended up actually trying to make themselves on their own and um, ended up getting um, a, a sex worker kind of position and then um, actually being in a human trafficking type of situation. The only way that that person was able to escape was going to a transgender health center. And at that place, the health center recognized the signs of abuse, let that person know they didn't deserve it. And then they came up 
with a way that they could get from the transgender health center safely into um, a domestic violence shelter. You know, mm -hmm. so those kinds of examples are ways that nobody, every, every single person here um, deserves to be without violence. And um, if, especially for those that are most impacted or um, in different situations that aren't often recognized, I think even more so. Place like Apilo and AWS, I mean, that we're used to working on the edges. And um, so yeah. I feel like that makes it even more important to ha have these welcome spaces. I could go on and on, but I'm going to turn it over <laughs> to some of the others on this panel. <laughs> Please feel free to, to jump in, but um, uh, maybe I should uh, start to ask you some of the audience questions. Um, Emily, maybe I can start with you. This question has to do with mandated reporters. So uh, mandated reporters includes uh, people at schools, churches, childcare centers, and senior centers. Uh, and as you mentioned before, most of those uh, services are closed. Uh, and so there's no access for seniors. Um, are there any ideas of teaming up with other service providers that have access like Meals on Wheels or meal delivery services? Have, I know that self-help is very active in delivering meals to, uh, to seniors throughout the city. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that possibility in terms of, of, of uh, reaching out for, uh, to, to address elder abuse issues? Um, yes, definitely. Um, since uh, shelter in place, we have been um, concerned about the seniors uh, who are isolated. So that's why when we have our uh, meals program, we conduct uh, wellness calls and also our seniors that's in our um, programs. Uh, other programs, we conduct uh, frequent uh, wellness call um, and then to make sure that to identify um, clients have food shelters uh, and clothing and also um, if they have enough assistance at home, how they, uh, what is their arrangement and uh, caregiving at home. So that's why we, uh, wellness call is very important and we continue to do so. And we identify a field um, uh, actually abused, like one of the case, uh, the, the client is very, um, uh, cheerful uh, the first a few times when we talk to her. But then uh, eventually, the more we talk to her uh, for uh, after a several wellness call, she start to disclose that there's abuse at home, that she planned to commit suicide. So uh, I think the wellness call is uh, something we continue would like to do. And um, if we have, we can bring that to uh, like a policy level and uh, make wellness call as uh, a mandate for uh, the programs to do. And, uh, but in the meantime, we are still uh, doing that to all of our seniors. And the senior centers, even though it's closed for the activities, but it's still open for pickup meals. So uh, the seniors can uh, actually go pick up meals and there's uh, staff uh, serving the meals every day. Um, that's one way to stay connected as well. Um, but definitely, I think wellness call is very essential right now because a lot of times the abuse um, usually won't disclose until you have the relationship with the client. So we started an internship in our a department. So we um, have the intern to make regular phone calls to clients that we think there's abuse, but not yet. Um, so we will keep doing that. So. That's a wonderful service. Um, Gina, can I uh, direct this next question to you? Um, have you seen or do you sense this been, in, because everybody's online, on Zoom, um, uh, do you sense that there's been an increase amongst uh, young people in terms of uh, problems like sexual harassment online or bullying online? Um, right. So with regard to that question, I feel like um, 
I do feel like the yeah the, the shape of how abuse works among peers has definitely shifted um like in, into like more online formats right i feel um as young people uh, young people i still consider myself young but uh, <laughs> um, most so much of our lives are online um to the point where um a given person you know if they tried hard enough and um, they could probably look up someone's like information you know this is this is a common form of like cyber um, attack that we call doxing where you know someone threatens to release someone's personal information online so that um, they'll be like harassed um or you can know, or have like nasty like nasty things sent to them and i think that's one of the forms in which like you know the abuse has changed i think um especially like in with the regards to the digital age um be, um and it's something i think is worth you know examining you know like digital liter literacy and also the ways that we inhabit our lives um, our lives on online um on the flip side i feel like um you know there's a reason for this right there's a reason why people are so willing to share themselves and be vulnerable online and perhaps in a in a more heightened aspect because of the isolation that we've been talking about you know um this is the main way in which we can, we're connecting to people now and so that does come with its own unique challenges um anon um being anonymous and receiving anonymous hate or like you know targeted messages is something that we have seen um in terms of like um how bullying works from peers to peers um and in another sense i think um like it, it's harder to address an issue or you know or, or get um, some type of closure if you don't know who it is who's directing you these messages um i think one of the you know strategies that when you know clients come to us and then they are you know facing cyber bullying is we talk about um you know perhaps you know like limiting the exposure you know in terms of like um making yourself available to these forms of attack but also um you know there's there's ways to protect yourself online too in terms of making your accounts private or like limiting your access to just friends i feel like the scope of how online one can be um like you can some people live entire like um different personas online i think um and this is something that I notice a lot with, um, in terms of um, like LGBT youth, because perhaps like they're able to access a part of their identity and like relate it to other people in a way that they are not able to, like, um, you know, in real life. And as a minor, that always has like you know, its, its own consequences, and it's something we, um, you know, are have, like are really sensitive to when we think about like safety and also. Um, you know, again, like how to like prevent cyberbullying. So um, um, there, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, um, I I just noticed that there's a question about um, making our resources more accessible. Um, I do want to highlight that um, at Apilo for our youth program, we do have a confidential text line, um, and it's one of the ways in which we're able to help young people. Um, if you know, if they don't want to make themselves known, if they, if for example, they can't be on the phone because the walls are thin, you have family around, you don't want them to know your business. So I, I do want to highlight that, and it's on our website too, I believe. Um, sorry to cut you off, Dean. Go ahead. No, no, I, that, that's exactly what I was going to ask. So Emily and Becky, so the question is really: Are there resources where uh, survivors who do not want to disclose their identity? can get assistance like an anonymous, anonymous helpline or other services where they do not have to give personal information? Yes, certainly. That was the, the hotline, which is still there at um, Asian Women's Shelter. And so that is the a number that folks can always call. And also what we've noticed is in these virtual times, people do get together for a uh, Zoom or another kinds of groups. And so in that, it can also be a place where folks can do a confidential, you know, private message or 
um, a signal that helps the the folks know that 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 they need some confidential help. Yeah. Emily, you reminded us that seniors especially do not want to disclose any type of abuse. It's almost like uh, really against our culture as as APIs. Um, is there some method that you use to uh, encourage, uh, you know, the seeking of help? Uh, is there a, a way that seniors can reach out to you without disclosing their identity? Yes, uh, if they they uh, report to us um, and they requested to, to be confidential, and all the information they provided will be uh, confidential. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very large and difficult question, but um, I think the question really regard is, is, is in regards to API survivors of all forms of interpersonal violence. Um, how do we take into account the culture and the language requirements uh, of, of survivors? Um, in, in providing the services that you all provide and, and what is it that uh, we've been able to do to kind of respect the fact that uh, uh, people speak other languages and have other cultural uh, backgrounds that may uh, impact the services that we need to provide. Yeah, I can go. This is Becky. I mean, that is the whole reason why we started the MLAM project uh, when we opened Asian Women's Shelter is to recruit and chain, uh, train and pay bilingual advocates and that they're paid on an on-call basis. Many of them have keep growing and gone on to be staff at AWS. Uh, so we have that whole array of staff, uh, bilingual staff, um, as well as team partners with on-call language advocates. And that is what, why we can address all of the language, you know, just a wide array of languages. What I think it's over 40, probably, you know, and growing and more. So that is so important. And also what is emanating out of that that um, is so deep and meaningful is that, for example, um, because Asian Women's Shelter, we were recruiting and training um, on-call language advocates and paying folks. Some of those folks, once they learned and were educated about what domestic violence is or what human trafficking and abuse is, realize they themselves are in that kind of profile and could get help or and or they know others in their family or in their community that are in those situations so it also broaden the area of how all of us who can identify that and help you know folks to um, address the the violence and interrupt the violence that they're experiencing and the prevention part of that, or um, just the sense of that, is that then those folks realize they're not alone. So they became their own advocate group. So right now, I'm just gonna name and give so, some examples like um, Hediana in the Indonesian communities here has like really, they've come together and they're thinking about like what will really work or what helps with um, our communities and a, a safe place to speak out and address it. Um, G at, in the Thai unit communities, they even named their community group, Thai Unity Community. And they get together um, and are, are a really potent um, community group to take action and also be a safe space for support. Um, that's also great too, because when you say, if for any of you, if you join that, it, that a Thai unity community group, for example, 
that doesn't put you out like, oh, I'm a survivor. That's why I'm going to that. You could be, um, a, you know, somebody who wants to contribute their, their ability, you know, their, their resources or, you know, help being a, a food providing place and those kinds of things. So it doesn't label you and yet it becomes a safe community circle. Jean, can I um, direct this question to you? Um, the question is what type of work is happening between communities, uh, cross community work uh, with other organizations? Sure. Um, on the youth end, we've been really um, intentional about, you know, we, we, we have historically had connections with, you know, local Bay Area, um, Youth, other youth organizations who serve, um, you know, different facets of uh, youth work, whether it's youth mental health, it's uh, youth um, involving with racial justice. Um, I think with uh, the shelter in place orders and because, you know, this new digital landscape from which we have to direct our programming, um, we've gotten really tighter <laughs> because, um, you know, we've been trying to expand our base in terms of what connecting youth to different services. And it's really important, especially now, because people are able to, you know, freely walk about that, um, if someone needs help, they they know where to go, right? So what we we have seen is, um, on the practitioner side, you know, the people de de delivering these services, we've been more intentional about, you know, st bolstering and strengthening these connections, so that if a youth comes to us and say they need help with like immigration or housing, then it gets referred to us, and in a sense, like that's really how a community builds. Um, I really, um, yeah, I, I really resonate with, with all these things that you know Becky is mentioning about, you know, the intentions of our institutions in the first place, the people that we serve, and the reasons, um, you know, for you know the genesis of our organizations. It was really to fill in a gap that we didn't have before, in terms of, um, you know, what does it mean for um, as an API survivor to be connected to legal resources where they can um, access help in their own language that they can understand. The law is, you know, already very hard to understand, um, you know, as just an everyday person, much less when you have to um, translate it. And so, like another thing I, you know, I constantly think about is the community is so important and also, you know, being adaptive, being multifaceted in ways that mo all these organizations are, is important because we aren't single issue people. Most of the time when people come with issues, there are other um, issues attached to it. For example, um, an API survivor who may, you know, have a precarious legal status who is worried that her abuser or their abuser is, you know, hanging over their head. What does it mean for them to receive help on both a domestic violence standpoint, but also an immigration standpoint. These are the unique ways that, like you know, our, our organizations at Apilo, um, AWS, and Self Help, like we're the bridge in our, in these communities. Um, and so, when I think of, you know, what is the best way to give help to the community at large, it's, you know, helping people who are the most vulnerable in our populations. And if the most vulnerable person in our, in our communities can receive like full, you know, you know, comprehensive help and support, then what does that speak for the rest of the community? And so I feel that's um, you know, a vantage point from which we all need to um, work from and imagine our work from a place where, um, yeah, like we are within our communities and we really represent the people that we are trying to support. Thank you. So we're running close to our close and I, I'd like to give you an opportunity to give some final uh, insights and final comments. Um, but first I wanna make sure that we thank you for your participation. It was a great conversation and I wanna remind our viewers that resources are available. If you look at the uh, website, uh, Self Help has a, a website, Asian Women's Shelter and uh, the API Institute 
have websites with resources in multiple languages. Uh, so uh, please uh, take advantage of the, the services that are being uh, described tonight. Um, any final thoughts, uh, Emily, Jean, or, or Becky? Well, my final thought would be a big thank you to you, Dean, and to all at Apilo. Um, it is like we did in person, right? We just work so closely together. I mean, from the first day we opened Asian Women's Shelter and Dean goes, I want to take you out to lunch. We're going to represent your residents at the shelter. And we actually, you know, were the cutting edge of this um, legal and um, dom social service, domestic violence way to work together. And that still continues. So from in-person to virtual and after many decades, I think that it, and now intergenerationally, I think it's very meaningful. And um, so with those good roots, I look forward to the continued growth and lots of appreciation. Mm -hmm. I yeah, just want to thank um, thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak um, today, especially in this special 2020. And um, I just want to um, uh, uh, promote, continue to promote the awareness of any types of abuse. And there's uh, always hope in here. But in the meantime, and um, daily uh, exercise, nutrition, uh, take good care of yourself, and knowing that um, there's always available resources in the community to be able to offer help to you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for, you know, including me in this conversation. And um, I really feel, you know, grounded by community that, you know, um, like, like you said, it, it feels like we're in person. It feels like this is just, um, you know, really intimate. And I think I really appreciate being able to kind of share the work that we've been doing. Um, I do want to highlight again that we, um, at Pila with our youth program services, we do offer a confidential text line for young people who, you know, um, need any type of support. Um, and yeah, I, I've been reflecting that this is, you know, Apilo's 45th year, of, you know, being around in the community. It's older than I am. And so, you know, I think it's a testament to how much, you know, it's, a pillar of the community and how much you know these services are still needed um so i'm grateful to be a part of this process and this conversation um so thanks dean becky and emily well thank you all um i want to remind our our viewers that um we have uh, two more conversations coming up on wednesdays at 6 p.m uh, so please check out the website one on uh the kind of rebuilding of our small businesses in, in our uh, API communities. The last one on, on racial justice as it intersects between the African-American and Asian-American communities. And so those will be on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. We also uh, would like to thank our sponsors for tonight, the law firm of Minami, Minami Tamaki and also CT Square Real Estate and Brokerage. Um, thank you all for the, uh, sponsoring this event and also the sponsors that you see, uh, the contributors that are acknowledged on, on our website. Um, finally, there's a chance that viewers will uh, qualify for a gift from uh, one of the small businesses that uh, we're supporting in Japantown or Chinatown. Um, so uh, please look out for that. And uh, this week, uh, until Friday, uh, we have a commitment to match uh, up to $5,000 any donations that we receive uh, from a, a, a donor. So please uh, consider making a donation to API Legal Outreach uh, to qualify for that match. Once again, I want to thank this great panelist group and thank you all for joining us. Uh, please remember that you can stream or uh, look at this uh, program on, on demand. And you can, you know, um, invite others to uh, to view it. I thought it was a very excellent discussion with our great panelists. And thank you for joining us. Good night.